Namaste. So we are in the first part of the synthesis of yoga, the conditions of the synthesis. And uh, in the first talk, we just had a little bit of background and chapter one, where basically Shurabindo uh, reminds us that there is a vast yoga going on in nature, meaning thereby that actually all life is yoga, whether we know it or not, that nature is trying to lift herself closer and closer to the Lord. And through form and name, she wants to fulfill the Lord and fulfill herself. So basically, it's a game or play going on between nature and the Lord. But in us too, there is a miniature nature, something of that vast universal uh, movement of the divine. And within us is the miniature divine, the Purusha has become in us the individual soul. So we become portion of this vast yoga which is anyways going on. And when we consciously participate in that process, that journey, then we use the word yoga, which is a methodized effort. But there is a method even in the madness of nature, in the whirling dance. And that should be in the reveals as we go by and by. So in the second chapter, the three steps of nature. It's very imagine, uh, you know, amazing if you just visualize that the divine Shakti has gone into the unconscious. Now as she is emerging, so often we hear about the return, but the return is not just a return which is simply from that darkness it has escaped back into the light. It creates, it brings something out of the unconscious which has plunged into the unconscious as a possibility and starts creating steps for consciousness to climb. So, ordinarily we think that consciousness escapes from the clutch of matter, but on the contrary, it keeps modifying matter and thereby creates steps for the divine Shakti. The divine Shakti creates steps and it creates steps for the soul of man to climb. So, the first step, the three steps of nature, the first step is the material life, which by and large has already been accomplished. So the so matter has been, you know, it, it has taken time for matter and life, the physical and the vital, to discover a kind of harmony. When we really go into the history of uh, evolution, Shubhinda describes it so beautifully in, in Savitri as well, that the first life forms, for two billion years, they have remained just trying to get onto the next level. But once it broke through that challenge of st life force stabilizing itself on a material basis, then we see that it spreads, it's, it begins to uh, enter into so many varieties and each variety of life carries something of the divine beauty, his, a thought of God if we may say so, and that's how life begins to blossom. So the first step is basically the body and along with it, the nervous life which comes together and weaves a whole step of creation. So consciousness takes it as a resting point. So material life or matter and life combined together. Now consciousness is not completely lost as in the inconscient realms, but it, it rests in a poise of inertia. That's what that poise is. And out of that inertia, some movement starts. The next step of nature uh, of uh, nature is the mental existence, and the third step is the spiritual existence. So then, should be describe the characteristic of each of these. So material existence is all about preserving. So everything must be preserved in a standard pattern because it's important from the stars, atoms, stars to every unit of life. You can't just break it. It, it preserves itself and is a strong tendency to preserve. So in that, there is a tendency not to progress because, you know, that's how it preserves itself. It doesn't like change. Whereas the characteristic of mental life is change. That's why mind is described as a restless monkey. It wants change. It can expand, go into different domains through various faculties and powers. And the characteristic of spirit is a self-existent beatitude. So we see it like there is a base which is of material existence and in that there are spiraling grooves of the mental existence which are going here, there, 
testing, trying every door, diving deep into the ocean, flying intergalactic travels and where not. So it goes through various means into these spirals until it touches some point of the self-existent beatitude of the spirit. So this is the process of evolution. All evolution is essentially nothing but a manifestation of the spirit which is concealed in matter. So this is about the three steps of nature and we need not go into its uh, details. Of course, it is very beautiful. Everything of Shurabindo is beautiful. <laughs> Every sentence is a marvel. But we go to the next chapter which is about the threefold life. So the threefold life is again, there is the material life which... <coughs> There is the material life or the bodily existence and the characteristic of the material life or the bodily existence is self-preservation. So even when mind develops upon it, it turns it to preserve itself. So now he is talking about not the nature of material, vital and the material, mental and the spiritual existence, but he is speaking of how life which organizes itself around each of these principles tends to operate. So material life, what we can call as the ordinary human life, is that which is centered around the needs of self-preservation. The instinct of self-preservation is very strong. And even when the mind develops, the mind tends to be used or utilized for the body's comfort, ease and its self-preservation. That's what the ordinary, usual material life is or bodily life of man is. Then the next level is mental life. Now mental life, the true sign of mental life is that it starts after a time getting independent of the physical demands and physical needs. So sign of real development of an intellectual, aesthetic, emotional life or a mental life, ethical life is that it begins to become independent of it. For instance, in ethics, people are ready to sacrifice their own existence for the sake of something which they conceive as an ideal. In their imaginative, aesthetic sense, they weave, they they are, they are can cut themselves off completely from the physical life. So that's where we see that the new emergent life begins to become victorious over matter. And yet, matter has its revenge. So after a while, it doesn't let the bird fly. So it, it is like a string tied back to matter. And that is why we have so many things that is okay. You can um, uh, fly into the mental zones only till you, the, the pangs of hunger don't draw you back. Now, while this may apply to ordinary life, but actually people who are, who are living too much into the mind can actually break through even from this barrier, at least for a while. So in mental life, nature has tried various experiments. One of them is the phenomena of the genius. So what really is genius? Nature tries to break beyond the barriers of the mind. And it tends to shoot into a certain direction and naturally the prize is that it uh, creates a certain kind of imbalance though it need not be so so we see often a genius being an eccentric that's the whole image and uh, one is um, not observant not much careful about the body the physical needs and how the body is going and uh, this is not the ideal but uh, Shubhinder says that nature uses it because it wants to evolve certain possibility what the genius does is it breaks a mold now the rest of humanity follows. So in the beginning, it is an eccentricity which appears like an eccentricity. But slowly this mental existence begins to uh, be uplifted to a new normal. And that is what we see today happening in the European uh, context where the mind has progressed into various territories. And one effect of all this is that it has generalized the mental development. So through education, through technology, so mental progress has been generalized. Otherwise, an average person was too much tied down to simply the bodily needs. This we see happening if we go back to the typical village life where things were centered around the immediate events and a little bit of that analysis, but largely it was centered, centered around food, progeny, the immediate family. So now because of the generalization of the mental life through all this uh, that has happened, the changes, uh, the mental development, the intellectual life has become more and more um, 
accessible accessibility and it has become universalized in the race by and large because nature doesn't like to leave any of her children this we see simultaneously that nature on one side it shoots but then it wants it brings back what has shot beyond and carries everything together so when we understand life like that then we will understand many of the phenomena uh, characteristically we will see this say for example in the field of politics now if you go through the four yugas it's very interesting that the first yuga the satyuga is the age of the brahmin so it is where the spiritual consciousness soars but then the vital has remained as it is so then comes the age of the kshatriya in treta then dwapar it's the age of the vaishya and in kalyug it's the age of the shudra so all that was left depressed and there were few elite who had shot beyond they are pulled back and they are generalized so there is a mixing and merger so for a time is it's the divine play and it's very fascinating when we see it like that for a time there is the generalization of things but after that because that's not the ultimate intention of nature there is a larger collective uprising towards a higher and higher state so this we see if we observe especially in the indian context you will see it very clearly that how there was a shooting beyond then there was a fall and then there is a generalization and then there is a uprising again so this threefold life so there is the mental existence and mental life which is largely concerned with not self preservation but with aesthetic ethical emotional intellectual activities for their own sake for their own joy not just for the sake of body so this we see in developed humanity and more and more it is being generalized in the race and the third is the spiritual life where we see not only the discovery of the self existent beatitude but to discover an ideal law dharma what is uh, to understand our everyday existence from a deeper standpoint from a higher standpoint and how that can affect our bodily and mental existence so this is the threefold life the first again has been established the second is picking up pace and is more or less reaching its completion with all these um you know gadgets and intellectual development and easy accessibility of many things so it is accelerating the mental life of man and the third is now beginning to return otherwise in nature up till now they were isolated spiritual freaks Uh, we don't use the word freak but you know there was a sanyasi who had wonderful experience and he you know shubhendu used the word they were like electrical rods who discharge the spiritual electricity <laughs> they became like rods so they received the spiritual electricity and it was like an earthing because the rest of humanity is not ready so they were supposed to be outside the pale of humanity uh, you exercise your freedom there but they were the ones who were giver of whatever good has come so it drew a distinction between the priest and the spiritual man the priest was still the high point of an intellectual development where one accepted that there is a beyond but one did not have the experience it was still based on scripture codes of conduct etc but the spiritual man went beyond so um, this nature has done very um, uh, already the spiritual existence spiritual life but it has not generalized it it is something that is bound to happen with a period over a period of time but right now it is still in uh, few individuals who have broken from the boundaries of the mental limits and entered into a greater and vaster consciousness so this is where he describes the threefold life of man and then in both of them shubhendu reminds us that there is the individual aspect and there is the collective aspect so individual mental development is um, one part but it must also become collective because mother nature takes works like that it doesn't allow one individual or a group to dominate over all the rest to the detriment of the rest so it will not allow it will bring back there will be a recoil so you know that's why a completely individualistic capitalistic society focused only around its own development or or um, ha- having money it will not work out because at some point it will collapse even logically uh, from the point of view of economics one can understand it so um, this is how life tends to recoil so these are the two aspects that shurbindo brings out and then comes this wonderful chapter where he speaks about the 
systems of yoga. So why he has given this background is because nature is engaged in yoga and we have to draw from her what she is intending. So nature when it evolves or manifests thing, it takes care of every detail. It doesn't leave in the end any detail which is untouched. So if you see a simple thing like the evolution of animal species, you will see it develops one type in uh, one species which is trying to break free. Then some other capacity, faculty, some other in another. Then finally it will sum up all of them and bring a new type. So here also we will see that as we enter into this phase of spiritual evolution, you will see one kind of spiritual movement developing and another one developing and in the end there will be a grand synthesis. But first, the different systems of yoga and here Sri Aurobindo says that whatever the method that nature is pursuing, we have to pick that up and accelerate it. So how does nature pursue? It concentrates or focuses on one aspect and by doing it, it shoots beyond herself. So here Sri Aurobindo brings uh, before us three elements which are necessary for any yoga. In practice, three conceptions are necessary before there can be any possibility of yoga. There must be, as it were, three consenting parties to the effort. God, nature, and the human soul or in more abstract language the transcendental the universal and the individual so quite naturally because uh, very often there are systems which deny the individual soul but if there is no individual soul there is no yoga then one has to worry about nothing it will, nature will carry its own way there is nothing really to be done but there has to be an individual who engages in yoga who experiences the sense of separation. Then there is of course the universal movement of nature which must consent. Meaning thereby if I have an aspiration and a call for the yoga but if my nature is not ready then it will remain like an aspiration which is frustrated. And then my nature may be ready and the individual may be willing but there has to be consent, the call from below and the grace from above. It must consent. Now this consent is based on a logic which transcends our human mind and its uh, understanding. So these are the three elements in any yoga. And therefore he says that um, essentially from the point of view of the individual, there must be a seeking. In yoga of knowledge, there must be a seeking for knowledge. Meaning thereby that we should not stop at any of the appearance. He will describe this in great detail subsequently. So we will just go through it a little hurriedly because the next chapter is the most important one. So uh, in yoga of knowledge, there has to be a seeking for knowledge. And this seeking has to go behind every appearance. And there Sri says that there could be two ways. One is that you discover the ultimate reality behind every appearance. This is the conventional yoga of knowledge. And he says that you need not stop there because knowledge is everywhere. So that knowledge which we discover beyond all phenomena, we can discover it even within the entire phenomena, all the phenomena. So how the divine deals with nature, how he divine, divine deals with material consciousness, how he deals with the um, blossoming of a bud into a tree and, and, and a flower, all this can be understood from that deeper aspects of, or the all comprehensive knowledge. So this is the aspect which he brings out. Then similarly, when it comes to bhakti, basically differentiate this system which are hierarchically arranged. Let's start with the most common one which is well known. So when one is conscious largely of the bodily life, then at that point of time, hat yoga uh, takes up the bodily life as the most important one. So through strenuous practice, now what really is the bodily life? Nature has created it. With what intention? It has created the bodily life to manifest the spirit. There is no second intention. So meaning thereby there are ways and processes which are still hidden as secret processes of nature which have not yet been activated. So through Hat Yoga, the Hat Yogin begins to activate these and thereby he engages um, into a kind of yoga through the body and enters into supernormal possibilities of the body. So, by doing it, his bodily life gets enhanced, health, vigor, even certain abnormal capacities and faculties, they begin to get activated, longevity, even for a long time, getting rid of diseases, um, staying away death, a lot of things which Hatha Yogins of old could do it. 
But Sri Aurobindo says, yet, what really is the difference is that though Hatha Yogi arrives at these aims, he, it is at the expense of the true intellectual and the spiritual life, very paradoxically. So, because you are focused completely on the physical self and its development. So, very often you will see, and sometimes by the creation of gigantic egos, if we look at the um, old time Hatha Yogins, Ravana is a Hatha Yogin, and many of these uh, Dhruv is Hatha Yogin. So, uh, these Hatha Yogins, Dhruv, Dhruv is Hatha Yogin, who, you know, Hiranyakashup is a Hatha Yogin. So, in that the Kul, because they had completely physical oriented, they used to practice Hatha Yoga. And this Hatha Yoga was a very elaborate and strenuous process, not the way it is practiced today. Today it is practiced, basically Patanjali codified it and just enough to keep the body in a good health, that's all. But not the way Hatha Yoga was practiced. Not really Hatha Yoga, but certain asanas which are good for the health of the body in general. But Hatha Yogins, it was a very elaborate process. Every day, running into hours. As I, I think earlier I mentioned, there was a Hatha Yogin in Bangalore, I am aware, who for 8 hours a day used to do Suri Namaskar. So you have to withdraw from the world. You can't just engage in worldly life and talk about Hatha Yoga. I mean, uh, comprehensive or, uh, you know, condensed version apart. So, this was the problem. And at the end, Sri Aurobindo says, what have you really achieved? It doesn't really lead to self-realization. Your bodily life is prolonged. Yet, you may have a gigantic ego. That's what we see in Ravana, we see in Hiranyakashup. So, we don't want that. Therefore, he says that though it was, you know, for those who still have a Deh Atmabodh, who mistake the body for the self, for them, Hatha Yoga comes very naturally. And for that kind of humanity, that's why you see it becomes very popular with a kind of mentality. The average man is focused so much on the body. And that strikes him very much. Then there is Raj Yoga. Raj Yoga is about essentially mind control. So it, it's that practice is about uh, playing with the psychological forces of the mind. Take for instance, somebody has done or said something to you which you don't like. So ordinarily the reaction will be that you get angry. So Raj Yoga will practice, you know, nowadays those things come. Forgiveness. Now what is, this is a kind of Raj Yoga. <laughs> you, you just substitute the negative emotion with something which is more positive. So by doing this practice, there is a degree of mind control because you can't practice it unless there is a certain degree of control over the mind. And again through a one-pointed concentration of the mind, again the mind... Uh, opens into an inner mind with abnormal possibilities, abnormal faculties which can come, which are known as the Siddhis, born of Raj Yoga and eventually one enters into the trance of Samadhi, where one completely withdraws from the material existence and uh, annuls oneself. Again, Sri says, what is its utility with regard to the world and with regard to our own uh, fullest possible de development because he is not focused on any other aspect of uh, our existence. I have had very interesting discussions sometimes with some of the practitioners of Raj Yoga and they were so happy with a very limited understanding of what God is and how this world is and they are just fine with it. <laughs> and it, I was just wondering how can one just be satisfied with this kind of a uh, I would almost say childish understanding of how life is. But that's how it is because it focuses on an area of and it works admirably well within those limits. Its ultimate effects, no doubt, are tranquilizing the mind. Makes it purer by certain practices, yam, niyam, etc. There is a certain amount of discipline and self-control. But with regard to mother, when she was, uh, she said, there are disciplines like the heart yoga and raj yoga. You may practice them assiduously and yet you may not know spiritual life at all. So, the disciple was a bit, you know, distraught. He said, Mother, but don't they give us discipline? She says, yes, but a discipline in itself is not what we are seeking. So, beyond it, beyond these two, Hatha Yoga and Raj Yoga, of course, there is the breathing and the Kundalini, all that. I am not going into that detail. And then there is, the Trimark. So Trimark, first time we see where it takes, it develops your, our complex psychological existence. So Trimark takes into account our intellectual life, 
discernment it takes into account the emotional life it takes into account the will in works the faith all these different aspects of our um complex psychological existence and it develops them by again concentrating them on the divine as master the beloved as the soul person soul reality and thereby finds its own culmination in a door of escape so this too is uh, a wonderful path a wide path the path of the gita but the problem is here again it doesn't let the divine enter into every detail of a life so a typical trimargi supposing he is practicing medicine so you have to practice medicine through a nishkam bhav so i am not doing it for the sake of money i won't do it for the aggrandizing of the ego i'll do it as a service to the divine so it's wonderful because inwardly you are you become more and more free and uh, but what about the field of medicine is there a new possibility to heal that is not the concern of somebody who is following the path of trimarga so again in bhakti yoga the bhakta gets too happy uh, he is liberated into the beatitude of the lord but he doesn't realize that the lord dwells in all beings so again shrivindra says that we need to generalize this into all comprehensive again the path of bhakti need not be simply adoring the divine beloved within but to discover him in every human being in every creature in flower and bird and stone and human beings of course so the most difficult of all but that's how the bhakta bhakti can generalize itself so again uh, wonderful path but with its own limitation so he speaks about these systems of yoga in some detail and then shows their limitations and now we are ready for the after all the systems of yoga he comes to the synthesis so what really is the synthesis of the systems the first thing shrivindra reminds us is synthesis is not a successive or simultaneous practice of these different paths so synthesis of yoga is not morning i'll do hat yoga then i'll do some breathing exercises then i'll go to ashram and sit for meditation then i'll do some bhakti attend to some bhajan kirtan nice this thing little bit my emotional and aesthetic being then i'll engage 6 hours work in the ashram some karma yoga so he says that that's not how it is done nor it is done that okay for 2 years i'll do rigorous pranayam and hatha yoga practices to give vigor to my body once that is done i'll join up 5 year course in raj yoga because that will also help me after that for another 7 years i'll do trimarga and then i will take to shrivindra's yoga so shrivindra reminds us very beautifully this is a very uh, important point because this is the important chapter and indiscriminating combination in block would not be a synthesis but a confusion very clearly nor would a successive practice of each of them in turn be easy in the short span of our human life and with a limited energies to say nothing of the waste of labor implied in so cumbrous a process sometimes indeed hat yoga and raj yoga are thus successively practiced now there is something very important which shrivindra is reminding us and in a recent unique example in the life of ramakrishna paramahans we see a colossal spiritual capacity first driving straight to the divine realization taking as it were the kingdom of heaven by violence and then seizing upon one yogic method after another and extracting the substance out of it with an incredible rapidity always to return to the heart of the whole matter the realization and possession of god by the power of love by the extension of in born spirituality into various experiences then he reminds us such an example cannot be generalized its object also was special and temporal to exemplify to the great and decisive experience of a master soul the truth now most necessary to humanity towards which a world long divided into jarring sects and schools is with difficulty laboring that all sects are forms and fragments of a single integral truth and all disciplines labor in their different ways towards one supreme experience this was the work of shri ramakrishna paramahansa it's a great work the different sects different religions they are ultimately if you are sincere 
then you can use anything, any practice, go through any sect and you will discover the one abiding truth which is behind everything. This was the synthesis he came. Now, the synthesis that Sri is going to tell us is something much wider in its scope. And that is the difference. So, the synthesis we propose cannot then be arrived at either by combination in mass or by successive practice. So, before he comes to what really is the core of the practice, he reminds us that there is in India, there was in India, an uh, um, excellent uh, effort to synthesize. Now, what was the missing aspect of this synthesis? Till now, whatever we have read. So, they are known as Vedantic schools. So, ultimately, you pick up something in nature. Through that, you arrive at that which is beyond nature. Pick up thought and concentrate it on one object. And eventually, the thought or the idea will burst and release us into the reality behind it. Let's say the idea is meditating upon the divine, 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 whatever way, in whichever way, wherever we are, one day this idea, this thought will burst forth and reveal the truth which is behind it. Similarly, the heart of the bhakti emotion turned into a manifold relation with the divine. Though we may not know, but he becomes for us the sole uh, beloved, Father, mother, friend, leader. So one day this truth reveals itself in every way to our heart. Similarly, in yoga of uh, works, the will is completely focused on serving the divine rather than serving its self-interest and the ego. So this is the way we arrive at in traditional path. But all of them use nature to go beyond nature and merge with the purusha. What about the nature itself? As Sri reminds us that nature itself is trying something and you want to just use her to go beyond her and abandon her. So there he reminds that in Tantra, they followed this path of nature. What really is nature? And they took every activity of nature and there were two main paths. One was the Dakshin path, the path of power in knowledge, power operating in knowledge. So in the Dakshin mark or the right hand path, you discovered the knowledge behind every aspect of material creation, vital creation, everywhere. And that's how they discovered the gods, the goddesses, the various energy knots. Tantra literally means the method, the technology with which this creation. So it was a wonderful synthesis because there was a great discovery that behind every activity of nature, there is a conscious power of the eternal, a delegate power. So they caught hold of this power which was operating in knowledge. So, but power operating in knowledge, not knowledge beyond power. So this was the Shakti. But there was another path, the left hand path, which fell into disrepute, but it was the Ananda operating, power operating in Ananda. So there is joy in existence, but where does this joy come from? So every joy must be connected to the ultimate Ananda. So quite naturally it was very vulnerable, slippery slope, and they fell through it. But nevertheless, this is what Sri says, that though it has fallen into disrepute, especially owing to the developments of its left-hand path, nevertheless, in its origin, Tantra was a great and Pusa system, founded <clears throat> upon ideas which were at least partially true. Even its twofold division into the right-hand and left-hand paths, Dakshin Marg and Vam Marg, started from a certain profound perception. In the ancient symbolic sense of the words Dakshin and Vam, it was the distinction between the way of knowledge and the way of Ananda. Nature in man liberating itself by right discrimination in power and practice of its own energies, elements and potentialities and nature in man liberating itself by joyous acceptance in power and practice of its own energies, elements and potentialities. So one was about knowledge, the other was about ananda. But in both paths, there was in the end an obscuration of principles, a deformation of symbols and a fall. So in this way, we see the difference between these two paths. The Vedic paths or the Vedantic paths lean on the Purusha, the divine as witness, the Purusha who is beyond Prakriti beyond nature and the other one leans upon Shakti, the power that is operating within nature, its will to be a delight because when we look at the tri, uh, triune uh, 
डिवाइन ही इज सच चितानंद सो सत इज प्योर एग्जिस्टेंस द पुरुषा ही एग्जिस्ट एंड बिकॉज ही एग्जिस्ट एवरीथिंग एग्जिस्ट सो देर इज देर कैन नॉट बी एन एग्जिस्टेंस दैट्स हाउ द मदर से विदाउट हिम आई एग्जिस्ट नॉट बट देन सत इज नॉट ए लोन देर इज चित कॉन्शियसनेस दैट इज शक्ति सो विदाउट मी ही इज अन मैनिफेस्ट शी वॉज रिवीलिंग टू अर्स सीक्रेट ट्रूथ एंड देन कम्स आनंदा सो वॉट इज आनंदा मैनिफेस्टेशन दैट्स वेन आनंदा बिगिन्स टू प्ले सो सत एंड चित प्योर एग्जिस्टेंस एंड प्योर कॉन्शियसनेस दे कम टूगेदर एंड देन देर इज द आनंदा एज द ऑफ स्प्रिंग ऑफ एन यू नो इट शोन एज द चाइल्ड एंड देन द चाइल्ड गोज अबाउट एंड क्रिएट्स अ होल यूनिवर्स शोबिंदो this child is the krishna who is playing with the universe why because he is the child of ultimate sat and chit together they have come so something like that exists in human consciousness also so all these paths they took sat and pure existence chit by the right hand tantrics the left hand people took ananda and that's how we see that you know certain kinds of tantra paths took to a whole approach so he says that basically it leans on power energy the um, the divine mother the chit tapas and then what it really means is that but if anand is the creator and begetter of all becoming its method is tapas or force of the purusha's consciousness dwelling upon its own infinite potentiality in existence and producing from it truths of conception or real idea see actually it is the mind which enjoys and the mind enjoys according to the idea that it contains of the joy that is there in everything so it is that which is the real origin and if we catch on to that even in the most physical activities what is that originating impulse and we catch on to that then the enjoyment multiplies it's not just an individual little ego which is engaged in pleasure or joy as we understand it but the ananda which is inherent in everything even a small little if somebody does a little painting somebody write something see all creative surge is accompanied by an ananda even Uh, childbirth one of the things uh, human beings human mothers experience something like that when a child comes into existence because it's inbuilt mechanism anything which is creative anything which is like the bursting of something new and that's called um, otherwise as the aha experience when we suddenly get a creative insight so this ananda how does it come how do self any insight creative insight comes which gives birth to ananda our consciousness concentrates upon something so it's not joy or pleasure joy or pleasure is that consciousness is running here and there like water and air and wind all around but imagine that somebody is focused on let's say writing a poem and you brood upon an idea the idea could be an experience that you are going through and suddenly there is an outburst a creative outburst why because our consciousness is brooding upon it all great um, or all authors know about it all painters know about it they brood upon the idea and then there is this ananda which expresses itself through form whether form of words form of activity anything so this is the principle the same principle applies in yoga and that's what shri bindu is reminding us how it happens its method is tapas or force of the purusha's consciousness dwelling upon its own infinite potentiality in existence and producing from it truths of conception or real ideas vigyana which proceeding from an omniscient and omnipotent self existence have the surety of their own fulfillment and contain in themselves the nature and law of their own becoming in the terms of mind life and matter so the purusha broods upon himself that's the original tapa and then how as he broods consciousness brings out explodes into countless universes and systems of words but now comes this uh, take home point for us the eventual omnipotence of tapas and the infallible fulfillment of the idea are the very foundation of all yoga in man we render these terms by will and faith a will that is eventually self effective because it is of the substance of knowledge 
and a faith that is the reflex in the lower consciousness of a truth or real idea yet unrealized in the manifestation. So two things, our will and the mother uses the word two things which are necessary, endurance or perseverance. What is it? Will that continues to apply itself. So when it is said, don't let uh, your asan be shaken, often we'll hear asan dolne laga. The yogin is asked to sit on his asan. So this is the inner asan where he sits with his will. Will should never deviate. It should never be clouded by doubt and okay, maybe yoga is not for me. These suggestions will come from the adverse forces. Oh, I am useless. I am not supposed to be doing this yoga. By mistake, I have taken up the path. They want to deviate the will. Because if will changes, will and faith are the powers on which yoga is built. If they are clouded, then the whole building becomes topsy-turvy. So, will must remain, faith must remain. First, they must grow, they have develop. So, that's a, altogether a different thing. So, Sri reminds us, it is this self-certainty of the idea which is meant by the Gita when it says, Yo yashraddha sa eva sa. Whatever is a man's faith or the sure idea in him, that he becomes. If I have faith that transformation will be, it will be. Today or tomorrow. Time taken, difficulty, challenges notwithstanding. If I keep applying my will, however in a minuscule way, in that direction, I'll end up realizing it. It doesn't matter how much time, how much challenges, difficulties that will come the way. So first hint is giving us is will and faith which are the most important element. Because that's how creation has come into being. <clears throat> then he reminds us, we see then what from the psychological point of view, and yoga is nothing but practical psychology, is the conception of nature from which we have to start. It is the self-fulfillment of the Purush through his energy. So what nature is doing, it's not hindering us, it's not trying to obstac create obstacles. That's how we look at it. But nature is the executing power of the divine. It is trying to fulfill the Purusha in everything. So everywhere you will see a little existence, little consciousness, little joy. <laughs> That's how it is trying in its own. But in every activity we must... Um, you know, fulfill it by the onrush of the divine. But nature is trying the same thing in, in, in a certain way. But the movement of nature is twofold, higher and lower, or as we may choose to term it, divine and undivine. Now, Sri reminds us something very important and interesting. The distinction exists indeed for practical purposes only, for there is nothing that is not divine. And in a larger view, it is as meaningless verbally as the distinction between natural and supernatural for all things that are, are natural. All things are in nature and all things are in God. But for practical purposes, there is a distinction. So what really is the distinction? Distinction is not moral. Distinction is purely from an evolutionary point of view. There are things which belong to the past, let's say animal nature. Do we call it undivine? When a tiger tears away a deer, do we say, oh, such an evil fellow? We don't say it's evil. He is hungry. Nature has endowed it with an instinct to pounce. Nature has equally endowed the deer with an instinct to run away. Now, you see, <laughs> nature is playing within itself. Through the forms, it's expressing something of the divine. And if you could enter into a larger vastness, the whole thing will appear like a delightful play. So, nature doesn't... Uh, Act the way we understand. So it's a it's a movement within lower nature, all these activities. But in human beings, the, the play can be upgraded to a higher level. That's what is meant by um, the higher nature. Meaning thereby, we can play the same play, but with much greater perfection, much greater delight, much less possibility of error, with practically no pain and suffering. So that's why the play needs to be upgraded. In the undivine nature, there is division, there is suffering, there is pain, there is hatred, there is jealousy, there is lust and fear and all the rest. But in the higher supernature, there is nothing but delight. There is the surety of what we are doing. There is no error. There is the right discernment. All this is there in the higher nature. 
So he says that this is the first thing to understand. The passage from the lower to the higher is the aim of yoga. Again, third important point. And the passage may affect itself by the rejection of the lower and escape into the higher. The ordinary viewpoint. This is too low an activity and I don't engage into it. See, there is a line in Savitri. Each part in us desires its own absolute. In smallest movement, there is room for deepest needs. So one is, I reject this and I enter into that higher supernature and be full of that perfection. Ordinary viewpoint. Or by the transformation of the lower and its elevation to the higher nature. Every activity of nature that can be transformed must be transformed. And we can take several examples, you know, what we call as anger in the lower nature. Due to weakness in the vital, violence. What is it in the higher nature? We see Rudra and Kali. The same Kali which is Bhadra Kali becomes Rudra Kali. Same power and we don't say, oh Kali is bad. She is doing it very consciously. There is a delight for the seeker when Kali comes and stands that I am going to take your ego today. And the seeker says, wonderful mother, I have been trying so badly. Thank you, you have come. So the same activity changes and transmutes itself. Of course, certain things will go away like fear. So fear has no place in higher supernature. Why? Because... You discover the same oneself everywhere in everything. Fear comes from shrinking. I shrink from something and therefore fear enters. When I don't shrink from anything, why? Because everywhere there is the discovery of the divine, then there is no fear. And then the third or the fourth, <clears throat> he reminds us, the method we have to pursue is to put our whole conscious being into relation and contact with the divine and to call him in to transform our entire being into his. So we are not allowed an escape. That is the easiest thing. Oh, this is difficult. Cut off. Leave. In that movement, not about people and persons, but in that movement, if there is a movement of nature within, one has to confront it one day. And at that point of time, one calls the divine into that movement. Doesn't just run away from that. So this is the method that Shubhendra gives us in a sense. Thus, in a sense, God himself, the real person in us, becomes the sadhak of the sadhana as well as the master of the yoga by whom the lower personality is used as the center of a divine transfiguration and the instrument of its own perfection. In effect, the pressure of the tapas, the force of consciousness in us, dwelling in the idea of the divine nature, upon that which we are in our entirety, produces its own realization. So basically it means when we have a challenge, instead of wanting to run away, we must aspire for truth, for light, for beauty, for the divine wisdom, for the divine power, to act and inform us, so that that action can become more and more divine rather than trying to run away. So that is the purification refinement required in this yoga. Fifth point that he reveals to us. In psychological fact, this method translates itself into the progressive surrender of the ego. Well, mother is not yet there as taking charge of the ego, <laughs> yoga. So he is using the terms which are a little more technical. Progressive surrender of the ego with its whole field and all its apparatus to the beyond ego, with its vast and incalculable, but always inevitable workings. So everything that is happening inside, nothing is to be left aside that, well, when I am meditating, wonderful, but rest of the time my life will go its own way. Everything that is happening inside has to be consecrated to the Divine Mother. Here he uses the word beyond ego because... Obviously, the Divine Mother has not yet come to take charge of the yoga. And that made things so much more easier and simpler. Certainly, this is no shortcut or easy sadhana. You want to run away? There are so many places. That's why when people came to the Mother and said, we want peace, she would say, okay, you go to Raman Maharshi Ashram, you'll find peace. Peace is there here. But much more than that, there is the pressure of transformation. 
After a time, the pressure is relentless. Every little part is laid bare. You want to close your eyes? Look here. Look here. Ultimately, you offer it. You surrender it. You can't escape. Because it is there, right there. And the, the transforming force will remind us again and again. But paradox is when you go, supposing go away. This pressure is not there. But at the same time, the joy that came from the contact is also not there. That you know, close contact. So this is the difference. So he says, it is no easy sadhana. So what is really required? Do we have to require to be a great yogi? If at all we may use that obsolete term. What is really required? Because it's a difficult sadhana. He says, certainly this is no shortcut or easy sadhana. It requires a colossal faith. An absolute courage. And above all, an unflinching patience. So in our kitty bag, pack the bag, we should keep these three things. And always remember, faith, colossal faith, whatever may be happening. Faith, faith, faith. And then he says, courage, absolute courage. Heroism, courage is too. When the ego is being chopped to pieces and pulverized and uh, turned into masala for masala dosa of the divine, don't say, what are you doing to me, sir? Spare me at least this ragtag cloths on my body. Why are you stripping me bare? That time you let go. Okay, fine. I am in your giant washing machine. Do thoroughly whatever you want to do. So it requires courage and patience. It's not like, sir, five years you have pulverized me. Is it okay now? No, my child. <laughs> Niroda once asked Yorabindo. He said, sir, uh, beat me uh, as much as you want, but never abandon me. <laughs> Shabinda says, beat you from time to time. Abandon never. <laughs> it's, imp it's necessary for the work. You can't have trust. So, these, they will do. But faith should remain. Otherwise, the push machine stops. Because obviously, when we start crying, uh, complaining, then we get stuck at a point in the yoga. And there is no worse stage than to be stuck at a point when the purification was going on. So because one cannot go through the purifying fire, one just remains stuck. It's not a good thing to happen. Go through it with faith in the divine. For it implies three stages of which only the last can be wholly blissful or rapid. The attempt of the ego to enter into contact with the divine the wide, full and therefore laborious preparation of the whole lower nature by the divine working to receive and become the higher nature and the eventual transformation. Last one is quick. But first is we try to come into contact through remembering, offering. Then one day the divine says, sure, are you sure? He asks us, sure, shall we start? Hare, yes, Lord, you are there, what is there? Sure, yes, okay. Then you say, oh, seriously, you took my... <laughs> but then it's a long process. Once the divine says, yes, nothing can keep us away. Because he knows, he knows he is fulfilling himself through each form. In fact, however, the, the divine strength often unobserved and behind the veil substitutes itself for our weakness and supports us through all our feelings of faith, courage and patience. If it's not there, don't worry. She will supply. It makes the blind to see and the lame to stride over the hills. The intellect becomes aware of a law that beneficently insists and a sucker that upholds. So that's what we see, you know, how yogin, some of them. On one side, there is the beating. On the other side, there is the nice balm which is being applied. So the day we are able to see both hands as nothing else but the divine, he, he rides in the car, he strikes in the spheres and is full of compassion. So this is how the divine operates. The heart speaks of a master of all things and friend of man or a universal mother who upholds through all stumblings. Therefore this path is at once the most difficult imaginable and yet in comparison with the magnitude of its effort and object, the most easy and sure of all. A wonderful assurance, right coming at the beginning itself. It is difficult, but it is 
equally the most certain of all why because who takes charge of this yoga it is the divine mother how can her work ever remain incomplete so our effort is to come more and more in contact with the divine mother to give ourselves more and more all that we are all that is happening in our outer life inner life and to aspire patiently persistently for the change and she will bring the change even when we cannot aspire she is still there pushing us till a point come when we say oh ma 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 so many things in life which only come to accelerate the aspiration and then one looks back and says i wish one could do it without the push <laughs> from the mother cat <laughs> so then the sixth or seventh point very interesting he says there are three outstanding features of this action of the higher when it works integrally on the lower nature <clears throat> because people ask steps and stages which stage are you <laughs> we are all in the same stage why we are all in that giant washing machine some have been cleaned a little more some less some some jiddi dag resistant stains are being removed in others because they are feeling so uh, you know there was a little bit of rupture so that material is being segregated but we are all in the giant washing machine where the process who is ahead who is behind so shobindo reminds us in the first place it does not act according to a fixed system and succession as in the specialized methods of yoga why because divine mother is the all comprehending she is not going to act oh two hours meditation very good report card two and a half hour meditation get little more marks mother he sits for five hours okay good good he gets 9.5 out of 10 none of these things her way is beyond what we can comprehend it's not what we are doing the sitting for how many hours what we are doing inside the inner motives what we are doing in our everyday life all this goes into her consciousness and she touches every little point with her light and power so it doesn't act according to a fixed method but with a sort of free scattered and yet gradually intensive and purposeful working so uh, as we go through it we realize that how the intensity grows because every little part that is changed over crosses over it adds to the intensity all that was not claimed in the beginning one one feels one is you know doesn't have many things and all this is uh, doesn't even touch one and suddenly one discovered that that which one thought is normal is not normal it needs to undergo a change it's normal from the human point of view but it needs to change so there is a pressure and every time that little part changes there is a greater intensity and then he reminds us that what what is the uh, this purposeful working what determines it determined by the temperament of the individual in whom it operates the helpful materials which his nature offers and the obstacles which it presents to purification and perfection each one has his own and they are different so you know this idea of look at this fellow this is Uh, means one has not taken part into this yoga this idea that i'll teach you a method of concentration in the heart or the head for this yoga excuse me there is no such thing you can pick it up this method or that but the center is the mother methods will come and go but to turn yoga into a fixed system this is not what shurbindos intended he is himself saying that it doesn't work or operate like that and <clears throat> in each one it's a unique journey so there is again this tendency to standardized all must do the same thing that's not how this yoga operates turn to the mother open to the mother for each one she will take through the path that each one has to be taken therefore each man in this path has his own method of yoga <laughs> it's important to remember because nowadays you see all kinds of things mushrooming uh, shobindo's yoga there is somebody who is teaching a you know pune yoga and this yoga and god knows 
Shubhendra himself has revealed what this yoga is, and in in a short one sentence he said, "All who are turned to the mother, this is the crucial crux of this yoga." Yet are there certain broad lines. So he reminds us that well, what we are revealing is broad lines. Secondly, the process being integral accepts our nature such as it stands organized by our past evolution and without rejecting anything essential compels all to undergo a divine change. So it's not like uh, the divine mother accepts us just as we are. There are no two comparisons. It's not a yoga where you know it's a field of spiritual ambition. This person is ahead. How did he go there? No, in each one it's working differently, and each one is unique. That's the beauty of this yoga. The divine, um, you know, absolutely uh, enjoys that. That's why this world has been created. Everything in us is seized by the hands of a mighty artificer and transformed into a clear image of that which it now seeks. Confusedly to present, we begin to understand what the Vedic rishis meant when they spoke of the human forefathers fashioning the gods as a smith forges the crude material in the smithy. So, an activity which appeared to us animal, suddenly it changes into human, and suddenly is that same energy is lifted up into its divine possibilities. So this is how the power operates. Thirdly, the divine power in us uses all life as the means of this integral yoga. Every experience and outer contact with our world environment, however trifling or however disastrous, is used for the work. And every inner experience, even to the most repellent suffering or the most humiliating fall. becomes a step on the path to perfection so no escape doors if we have to go through we have to go through what we have to go through but all that we need to remember is she is carrying us so that the kush mother's mother uses a very interesting um, word she she says you know the great cushion is the divine love because <laughs> when the child begins to walk he'll fall several times and every time he falls the divine love is there and he'll slowly mold and mold everybody who looks back few years discovers oh, i was that foolish fellow because the change takes place and the change is really nothing less than a miracle of miracles so Shubhendra reminds us every experience is used as a material, and we recognize in ourselves with open eyes the method of God in the world, His purpose of light in the obscure, of might in the weak and fallen, of delight in what is grievous and miserable. We see the divine method to be the same in the lower and in the higher working. All life is a yoga of nature seeking to manifest God. and finally says integral method and an integral result so he speaks about these three kinds of liberation sayuj the growing contact with the divine in every member in mind and heart and will and sense and body and breath and speech and act and heartbeat and everywhere in every activity even in the organs eventually that's what transformation is about cells everything growing identification contact and identification sayuj Salokya, dwelling in the same status as the divine, samipya, nearness to the divine, and sadrishya, meaning thereby the human nature begins to become molded into its divine equivalent. Human love begins to change into divine love. Human thought begins to change into a divine intelligence, upgrades itself. Human will begins to change into the divine will, fulfilling itself. and eventually of course the human body changing into a body growing increasingly divine so this is where and at the end he reminds us that this yoga in all the chapters he reminds us 
This yoga is not about just an individual perfection. If at all such a thing were possible. Because God is fulfilling himself not in an individual only, but in the entire collectivity in the world. So each individual becomes more and more a magnet to effectuate this yoga in the whole world. So it's not like one individual getting liberated or transformed. There is no such thing like that. As the yoga proceeds and progresses, automatically like a dynamo, it begins to radiate. As Sri says, one becomes a divine center in humanity. So... <clears throat> This is the consummation, which is no other than the kingdom of heaven, which is reproduced in the kingdom of heaven without. The widest synthesis of perfection possible to thought is the sole effort entirely worthy of those who is the most ready for the yoga, whose dedicated vision perceives that God dwells concealed in humanity. Then only... It's as long as it's just me, my yoga, and it's still a far cry. So, I just want to read one more little passage in the previous chapter, which we have left behind because it's a very powerful chapter. When it describes about the spiritual life and how it tends to escape from the world, but it need not be so. The generalization of yoga and humanity must be the last victory of nature over her own delays and concealments. Even as now by the progressive mind in science, she seeks to make all mankind fit for the full development of the mental life, so by yoga must she inevitably seek to make all mankind fit for the higher evolution. The second birth, the spiritual existence. So he speaks about that as the legendary Satyug, where first we, we have already spoken about these two births. Um, the Vedic Rishi speak about the threefold birth, which is of course the first is the material existence, the second is the mental existence, and the third is the spiritual existence. But here he is speaking about the transformation of terrestrial life. The true and full object and utility of yoga can only be accomplished when the conscious yoga in man becomes like the subconscious yoga in nature, outwardly conterminous with life itself, and we can once more, looking out both on the path and the achievement, say in a more perfect and luminous sense, all life is yoga. So this is the essence, the conditions of the synthesis. This is a yoga of nature, where the divine is doing the yoga through his hidden presence and nature is picking up the idea and trying to build forms and names and activities to reproduce this original image which is, which is seated in her heart. This is the yoga of nature. Now, in that process, she has evolved material existence. If we really look at material existence, just the material universe, it gives that, it, she's trying to create something of the divine sense. The ever-expanding space, the uh, unending spirals of time, the drifting of the stars, all of them, the planetary system with the sun at the center and, uh, you know, planets revolving around it, then upon earth itself. And then she evolves, she has evolved life and the mental existence. And now she is striving to evolve the spiritual life. But spiritual life, the previous efforts, because of the pressure of nature, there have been individuals who have entered into the dazzling splendors of the spirit. And they stopped at some level or the other thinking this is all. But Sri reminds us that these are early experiments of nature to create, to, to assist our spiritual evolution. What did they do? They remained as a beacon, as a reminder. There is something still there, something still there. And mankind tried to follow turned and made it into a sect, a religion, doesn't matter. These were early affairs, uh, efforts. And nature then breaks those molds. And it brings fresh impulsions. So this is how the spiritual evolution has gone on so far. But largely in individuals and small groups with limited aims. 
but nature has accepted it often at the impoverishment of the material and the mental existence but then now the time has come when the next step can be taken and that is the fullness of the spiritual life and that's where Sri Aurobindo's yoga steps in that up till now all these were partial systems of yoga partial efforts of individuals to have a glimpse of the eternal and that is so dazzling that there was a tendency to run away because this life appeared so much in contrast but then shubhendra reminds us what nature does nature doesn't operate like that she evolves a new element but then returns back to that out of which it has evolved and harmonizes them so life evolves out of matter but then there is a harmony between living life and material basis on which it evolves similarly mind evolves and initially there is a rush of the mind in certain eccentric geniuses to remain get cut off from their physical and vital existence but then mind returns and it can make our physical and vital existence much better similarly spiritual life in the course of evolution has a tendency to recoil from the physical existence but it must return back and eventually enrich it because that is the goal of nature how to do it he has told us because there is something hidden in nature not just the divine being but also the divine consciousness not just the purusha but also the divine shakti and more and more we have to open ourselves here he has used the word every aspect of life every event every happening within and outside all the ego reactions and lay them bare before the divine mother and then she will begin to act she will not act according to our mental conceptions of how she must act she may she will make the lame walk and she may make the athlete fall if that is necessary for you know the athlete is thinking oh i am the one i am the one see how far i have gone like that sap seedi khel not even once the snake has bit me and as it goes it falls because this is the process you have to take everything you can't just escape so it's a complete himalaya darshan not just one uh, gilded peak so she will take us through all this and it's a free scattered way that she works she doesn't work according to any standard formulas of the mind because she is the divine mother so what is required from our side is to keep on offering and surrendering to her opening to her and to keep harboring in our heart the faith the patience the courage the endurance and the perseverance perseverance that is necessary this is the background of the yoga and some aspects of the practice and its basis shubhendra will discuss in the books to follow so today we completed part 1